Thank you very much for those kind words and the opportunity to talk to you this morning about the future of gold mining. We've heard a lot about what gold mining has or hasn't done in the past, but the challenges in the future will be very different from the challenges we've been encountering in the past 50 years. Looking first of all at Goldfields, who is Goldfields? We are in the top 10 in global gold producers. We're domiciled in Johannesburg, South Africa, listed also in New York. But over the last 20 years, we've gone from being a solely South African producer to actually only having 15% of our production now uh, in South Africa. Over 2 million ounces of production. And as I say, 85% of that now is actually outside of South Africa. So we've become really a global producer. That was our, our goal that we set out around about 2005, and we've progressively moved towards that. So 2.2 million ounces a year, and as you can see, we're operating in four countries. Now obviously, we're talking about the future here. I believe that we've taken key steps already to position this company for the future. And at this stage, you don't see any handheld mining taking place in gold fields. We made that decision back in 2012 that we move away from conventional handheld mining or air leg mining. That stopped in Australia and Canada many decades ago and really only happens in isolated cases. The big producers don't deploy that anymore. We made the decision to move away from uh, the rock drill operator and move away from that kind of mining. Why? First of all, we believe it's safer. We believe it's more productive in the future. And you've got to look at what the people coming into the industry like and what they're prepared to do. The youngsters today are not prepared to kneel up against a rock face at three and a half kilometers and hold a rock drill. And I do believe that over the next 10 years, we're going to see handheld mining slowly actually disappearing from the mining landscape in places like South Africa. That's quite profound. And the industry there needs to position itself uh, for that in the future. So why do we need to change? Why do we need to embrace innovation and technology? Uh, because it's there, it's uh, interesting to do it, it's in vogue, or are there other reasons? Well, it actually comes down to survival. If we want to be an industry that is going to be around, in the next 20 years. We're gonna to have to change. And why is that? Well, all bodies are getting deeper. They're getting more complex. They're getting more refractory in nature. They don't lend themselves to conventional cyanidation like they used to. That means it's more expensive, recoveries are less. So the easy stuff is gone. Most of the stuff we're gonna be mining in the future is probably gonna be more uh, underground type operations. The big high-grade shallow oxide pits, we'd all love to have more of them, wouldn't we? Uh, but they're hard to find. And we've got a universe of hundreds of mining companies all looking for the same thing in the same jurisdictions. So we're going to have to change. Exploration is taking longer. To go from grassroots discovery to production takes many years. We don't have time. Grades are declining. The average grades we're mining at the moment are probably just over a gram. 10 to 15 years ago, there used to be multiples of that. And if you look at what the pipelines are bringing out in the future, we're probably going to be something like 0.8 grams a ton. That's already another 20% reduction. The grade's getting lower. Communities have found their voice. They want to have a piece of the action. They want to be involved, not just um, when you bring the mine into operation, but when you're actually conceptualizing building a mine itself. Governments want more. I think we've heard more about resource nationalism over the years. Uh, it's not going to go away. It uh, sparks up in one country, dies down, comes up in another country. So, and of course, gold will continue to uh, go up and down. So there's definitely a burning platform that has emerged and why we need to do things differently. So in the future, we're going to have to operate differently. A lot of people have got ahead of themselves on innovation and technology, and we're talking about robotics, we're talking about artificial intelligence, we're talking about the internet of things, all of these buzzwords, digital mining, etc. 
and they've all got their role to play. But the one thing we've noticed in the journey we've been on in innovation and technology over the last couple of years in earnest, we've sort of dibbled and dabbled into it over the last decade. There's a lot of things you can get right, first of all, integrate your operations. And if you look at each mine that we have in our group, I don't believe we've even optimized what we've got. We don't have seamless integration between all of the components of the value chain, between development, between uh, drilling and blasting, backfilling, ground support. If we could actually do all those things better, get people to the work face quicker, get them more productive, even before we start going into um, rugged sensors on uh, equipment underground, we'll already see advancements. But of course, I think technology is just moving along anyway. And I guess the philosophy now that we've adopted on technology is to say that it's like a tsunami coming at you. Think of innovation technology as that. You can't prevent it from coming at you. So you've really got two choices here. You know, either you can get on that wave and ride it, or it'll wash you away. You really can't ignore it. You know, people are saying, well, you know, this is not for us, it's for people in the future. It's happening today. The young people in your company who are under 30 are demanding that we do this stuff. And we have to listen to them because they're going to be standing up here in 10 years' time or even five years' time because the other thing, they want to be CEO within 10 years, not uh, 15, 20 years as in the past. So it is important that we take these things on, but we have to balance it with the need for us to do things better. But innovation and technology already can help us to get better information, get it quicker, make quicker decisions, and actually ensure that productivity and safety can improve. We've adopted the approach, we're not going to do this though, unless it either improves health and safety, it can reduce our costs, or it can enhance our revenue. We're keeping that very strict focus on this, whilst of course needing to listen to the millenniums who are coming through the process. So if you look at where we've come from and where we're going to, First of all, we need to move away from conventional mining to mechanized mining. That's already happening, and as I mentioned earlier, I really don't see a future on conventional mining over the next 10 years or so. I think it's going to be phased out over that period of time. It has enormous and very significant social consequences, because how do you take all of these people who were trained to do one particular activity of work and then retool them to do something else. There will be a lot of fallout. We won't be able to accommodate everyone on the journey, and we are going to have to find social solutions, uh, even though the tsunami is coming at us uh, with some speed. Then we'll move to automation. And automation is already taking place in pockets around our operations. If we can embrace those in the short term, we can already improve things, even if we sit with the same number of people in the operation uh, than what we had before. Digital mining, it's a big term with many different meanings to many different people, uh, but in essence, it's the ability to get more information quicker, real time, use that information to manage the business uh, a lot better than what you're doing now. We're also gonna have to embrace better information on energy and water usage and figure out how we're going to save those scarce resources because, again, they're going to be a lot more expensive in the future. Energy and water are not only going to be scarce, the cost thereof is going to increase in exponential terms. So really, we've looked at innovation technology and said there's four real pockets here you need to look at. It's obviously the, the hard technical side, the so-called technology issues. It's then looking at how the organization changes the skills base and the way it works. It's then looking externally how we create different partnerships with stakeholders that are going to work with us on this. And then obviously, it's greater transparency. There's a, a need for more information at a lower level than what we've seen before. So these are the real key pockets we're going to look at in terms of innovation and technology. It's not just about saying, you know, let me get the remote operated truck into the pit. Uh, because you might find that you buy the truck and guess what? The next time you fly up to the mine, 
the same truck you just invest a lot of money in is parked up on the side because we didn't actually do proper change management with the employees. We didn't talk to organized labor. We didn't actually retrain our people. We didn't take them on the journey. So if you don't take people on the journey with you, you know, we can stand up here in this podium and say we're going to do all this stuff, but you need to have thousands of people working in the same direction. That's not easy, and it takes time. So change management will be a key deliverable uh, in this process. So how are we looking at this in gold fields? What we've decided to do is split up our innovation and technology journey into three legs, Horizon 1, 2, and 3. Horizon 1 is all about what are the things we can do now to actually make a difference? How can we actually look at technology that is available today that we can get and actually roll that out? Uh, let's take an example. Remote loading underground is actually out there, and we're using it in some of our operations, but we're not using it everywhere. So if we could actually put that in place, that will already give us benefits. You have a hot seat changeover. You avoid a situation where uh, you have to have people go on the ground and change uh, the shift around. There's an hour or two lost. You have 24-hour uh, operations in some cases. You don't have people exposed to environmental conditions. So those are all the things that you can do now. But at the end of the day, what do you want to achieve over the longer term? You want to be able to grow your reserve life, and you want to be able to reduce your cost. That has to be the end game in a safer and more healthy fashion than what you're doing today. And that has to be the measure for us. So we've looked at this and said, OK, so what's the end goal? Where do we want to be with this? Where we want to be as a company is that in 10 years from now, we want to have an underground or an open pit operation that is completely remote. That the trucks, the loaders, the drill rigs will all be working in unison together and will be operated remotely. And probably even from surface or from a remote control center. And we've got remote control centers already. If you go down to Perth, at the airport you'll see Rio Tinto has a control center. I was in the Roy Hill Center last month down in Perth had a look what they're doing, you'll have a control center. And it can be many hundreds of kilometers away from the mine. So all of these are steps in our journey to create a fully remote operation. And what is that going to do for us? It's going to drop your costs. It's going to make it safer. We can avoid people being exposed to the rock face. And we can drop the cutoff grade. And if we can do that, as I mentioned, you have these ore bodies with much lower grades that we're going to be mining in the future. That's going to enable us to be able to make them economic. Otherwise, I think the industry is certainly going to uh, decline. Gold production has already peaked. We don't see gold production increasing from here. The challenge just to replace gold production is already with us today. So there's many things we are doing across our operations to uh, to do things better. Accessing exploration data quicker using algorithms. Merging data sets through using software that you can get from various software and IT providers is already going to speed up the entire exploration effort. As I mentioned earlier, what was the challenge? 18 years from grassroots exploration to new operation. We have to make that entire journey a lot shorter, and we can do so through innovation and technology. Automated drilling, remote drilling, automated and remote charging of blasting holes can already be done. I've talked about loading and hauling. We're seeing in the Pilbara in northern Western Australia that we're seeing remote operated trucks operating in pits. So solutions are there. The pieces, the building blocks are being put in place. For underground mines, we don't yet have a fully seamless integrated value chain of remote operating equipment. But I think in two, three years' time, you're going to see a lot of changes uh, from where we are now. Uh, it's moving at a hell of a pace. So working with technology companies to provide solutions is a key part of this effort. There's so much data that we don't use. 
so much we talk about big data. Big data is, in fact, a lot of data at a lower level that can be consolidated. And you, if you can get that information on a real-time basis and you can get people in a control room looking at that, the quick wins in terms of improved productivity are significant. One of the journeys we're going on is that we're going to have uh, sensors or little computer boxes put onto all of our uh, equipment underground. And we're going to be able to get that information on a real-time basis. Of course, the big challenge is you've got to have a proper backbone in place. And all companies that are looking to embrace innovation and technology should first and foremost be considering putting in a proper backbone, you know, having a Wi-Fi system, having fiber optic cables through the operation, having a mesh system so that pieces of equipment can talk to each other. If you don't get that foundation in place, then all the things you're trying to do from there will be very limited and you'll get frustrated and find you've got to go back. So that's one of the key things for us, is put in the enabling infrastructure so that you can actually access all of the key information uh, that you do need. And that'll speed things up quite a bit as well. If you look at OEMs, I think the challenge with the suppliers of our equipment is that we have to partner with them and work out solutions. You know, one of the things we've decided as a mining industry through the International Council of Metals and Minerals is we don't believe that we should have diesel-operated trucks and loaders underground, simply because it creates an unsafe environment with diesel particulate matter, with uh, temperatures going up, and so on and so forth. It's much better for us to move off that solution and see if we can get to battery electric machines. But if we're going to make that push, we have to collaborate as an industry with the suppliers of the equipment and make sure that they harness those things. So that's one of the other things we're doing uh, with suppliers. So I've mentioned a lot of this already in terms of what are the horizon one themes we're looking at, exploration efficiency, looking at the data that's already out there, finding a way to harness that data, make quicker decisions, improve the turnaround when we get off a plan don't find that it's a month before you actually find out you're off the plan, and then you have to put in steps to remediate that, and you'll get much better controls uh, in the short end. And looking at automation, there's lots of opportunities for automation. We've just ordered around about a half a dozen drill rigs at our Tarqua open pit mine in Ghana, where we move 100 million tons a year, and we believe that's going to speed up the, the blast hole drilling which is a key element in our whole value chain and has been a constraint in terms of us actually achieving our call on a consistent basis. So there's another pocket of excellence there as well. Also, we've had a lot of injuries and fatalities in the mining industry over the years through uh, people and vehicles working together in a confined space underground. That's not a great situation. And if you can move eventually towards having people and equipment completely separated, even if it's uh, just the light vehicles, never mind the heavy vehicles, that would be first prize. But of course, it's not so easy to put in additional declines, particularly going down many kilometers. So one of the other ways to work around it is to say, let's have retardation systems on the equipment. Let's have proper proximity detection systems on both people and vehicles, so that when you're in close proximity, there's warning signals, there's flashing lights, so that you don't find that vehicles run over people. We, we don't want that to happen. So again, technology is there. We're actually deploying that on our mines already. And the next step for us would be on the next generation of mines, we will actually separate people out uh, from equipment. The other thing we've learned with technology on mines is it's very hard to retrofit existing operations. Once a mine is set up, it's set up. So if you're going to make this leap and move the dial on technology and innovation, start putting it into planning for new mines you're building today and actually get them right uh, from the outset. And companies have to take bold decisions here. This is not like a business case on a new mine. 
on a business case on a new mine, you want to make sure the geology is right, the recovery is going to be there, you understand the costs. On this stuff, you're going to have to take some risks because you can't figure it all out up front. We're going to have to take risks, we're going to fail, we're going to have to redirect and learn from our failings, but you can't figure it out all the way through. And talking to the guys at Roy Hill down in Perth last month, they were saying that you just have to make a decision, you're going to do this. You can't figure out all of the outcomes up front, but in time you'll learn, redirect as you go. This is no different in our situation. Lots of exciting stuff we're doing. Drones, I think we've all heard a lot about drones. We've got drones down in Australia that are doing uh, geological mapping for us. They're enabling us very quickly to do surveys of our uh, tails, dams, and our open pits. And we can capture those images and look at where we were a week ago and see that we are complying with the geotechnical designs of the mining plans. It used to take much longer to do that. And of course, when you bring in something like this, there's always collateral challenges that come. And some of you may have read on the internet that uh, our drones were attacked by eagles uh, over, the, uh, over the tenements, and uh, we kept losing our drones because the eagles were attacking them. So obviously you have to figure out how you're going to sort out these challenges. Also, we have a, uh, a thing called a skimpy, which is one that runs along the ground. And that can do uh, aeromag surveys and mapping very quickly. And we can populate that data back into our geological systems and give us much uh, better and quicker information. So these things are not fads. They are providing uh, real benefits. We're doing remote rock breaking at South Deep. As you can imagine, when we mine these big stopes, we get big boulders that uh, might be a couple of meters high and a couple of meters wide. So we need to uh, break them up through impact breakers. There's a lot of dust and noise with that, so if we can operate it remotely, again, it's safer. Again, you don't have the, uh, the changeover of the shifts. And you can see on the left there, that's our control room, where we've got a guy sitting on surface who's operating that uh, impact breaker, which is three kilometers underground. So another big benefit there. In Australia, we've had significant benefits by putting in upgraded real-time fleet management systems that give us up-to-date information on dispatch, so we know where all the vehicles are, where they're operating. We can get uh, real-time information on the payloads, what they're doing, where they are. And as a result of this, we've seen real benefits. We've increased our tonnage at St. Ives over the last 18 months by almost 20%, and we've dropped our costs on a per ton basis by 30%. So there are real benefits accruing to us by doing this as well. At South Deep, obviously, it's a, a bulk, medium grade underground mine at three kilometers. So we have to de-stress the operations so that we can actually mine these big open stopes at depth. One of the things we need to do to make sure we can do that successfully is precondition the ground ahead, which is putting in longer drill holes into the virgin rock ahead of us. And that enables us to move those stresses ahead of the, the rock face so that we don't have face ejections on the actual area of working. One of the pieces of gear that we've actually put in place now is um, this uh, parameter that enables us to have ground penetrating radar. It's actually a thing that's only around about 10 kilograms. You can hold it up against the face and it brings back a reading that you can see on the iPad over there. And that will show you, in fact, if the uh, preconditioning is working because it should show that the rock is crushing ahead of the face and that will move the, the latent stresses in the rock further into the, the face itself. And you can do it right there. You don't have to send it back to surface. You've got one guy holding it up against the face. You've got another guy with an iPad. He'll know straight away if it's working. So very easy to do. Not a lot of training involved as well. Another one that we're rolling out as well is when you look at a mine like Agnew, you have many different sources of ore. Some of it's low grade, some of it's high grade. If we can actually sort the ore by grade, and often you can actually see this by the, uh, the color of the actual rock itself, we can ensure that we maximize the, uh, the best ore into the plant and we can stockpile the low grade uh, mineralized uh, ore or waste and not put that through as well. So that's going to enable us to reduce our processing costs. 
That'll enable us to lower our cutoff grades and we're starting to see benefits as well. So there's a lot out there which is going to give you benefits into the future. I'm running out of time, but I'll just focus quickly on the last three legs. Obviously, we need to get new people and different people. We have to retrain people. One of the things that I discussed with the Witz University mining faculty in Johannesburg two weeks ago was the need for us to change the curriculum of the mining engineering degree and make sure that we train people that will have relevant skills for the future. We're going to have people who are going to have to be more adept at working with systems and IT because the grunt work in mining is gradually going to disappear. We will need people who can operate complex equipment remotely as opposed to actually sitting on a drill rig or operating a truck. So there's going to be a massive change management uh, challenge uh, for people in the future. And of course, the leadership of the organization has to change. You know, we have to look more carefully at all the people we interact with. In the past, maybe we were more inwardly focused, looking at, you know, what is our daily, weekly, monthly production? Are we getting there? Now we're going to have to be looking and interacting with all the people around us. Communities are going to have to be taken along this journey because most of your workforce in the future is going to come from in and around uh, the mine itself. Partnerships are going to have to change. If we're going to go on this technology journey, we can't do it alone. Mining companies are not only going to have to work with suppliers, as I mentioned earlier, and with technology companies, but they're also going to have to work with other companies in the industry. It's far too much investment of time for us to do on our own. We need to leverage together. And certainly we're starting to see that through things like the ICMM, the various chambers of mines in the different countries we operate in. And that's the way we're going to move this forward. And I think the industry is prepared to consider this now because of the burning platform that we're in. Governance, of course, and transparency. There's a greater and greater need for more information. I don't think we're ever going to see that stop. And certainly, we need to make sure that we can be positioned to provide that information to the various stakeholders that we deal with, not just shareholders, NGOs, governments, communities, and all of the different entities who have an interest uh, in mining. And as you can see, there's lots of organizations here that we are part of, like many other mining companies, where their standards and their protocols are being expanded all the time on this basis. So I think in conclusion, there's a burning platform for change. I think we all realize that. And if we don't realize that, hopefully, once you've heard this, we do. We need to move from conventional mining to mechanization, to automation, and then digitization. That is the journey. We can't move from here to robotics straight away. That's some ways away. We're targeting 10 years for us to have our first fully remote operated operation. We've got to partner with everyone around us. And we're going to have to redefine the skills that we need. If we sit back here and just expect the skills to arrive, they won't. So we have to go to the technicons. We have to go to the universities. We have to work with them to make sure that they can give us the skills that we need into the future. And lastly, we have to be prepared to make mistakes. There's no exact science here. We don't know what the future is going to look like but we know that the future is going to change. Thank you very much for your time. I think we've got a few minutes. Got a couple of minutes for Sure. I'd like to thank Nick for a, for a fantastic presentation. Um, got a minute or two for a couple of questions, if anyone's got one. Um, there's one there, the gentleman there. Just get the microphone over to him. That would be great. It would be a quick question and quite a quick answer. That would be great as well. Sure. Uh, I'm just interested to know if the labor unions in South Africa are aware of the journey that you're trying to go on and how they're reacting to it, if they're putting pressure on you or pushing back in any way. A very good point. In South Africa, certainly, being a developing country with uh, significant unemployment and with a government that's looking for us to actually employ more as opposed to less, it represents a tremendous social challenge. So we don't have all the answers, but they do recognize that things need to change. 
and they do recognize that the way we've been operating in the past will not be a recipe for the future. But I think they're grappling with it. So we continue to have a dialogue with them. And I think that the challenge here is, how do we retrain people who are displaced in this process and try and find other work for them? That's not going to be easy, but it's something we have to think about. So it's, it's an area we haven't found each other, I think it's fair to say, but it's a topic on the table. Great. One more. Down there? Let's get a microphone there. Great, thank you. Hello, I'm Henry from Toomey Gold. Just a quick question, and that is, um, I think everything you've talked about regarding the um, technology is great. But considering, let's say, the, um, the history of the mine, mining industry, let's say it's about 300 years, I'm not too sure, about 300 years. Technology, five years. And then, um, let's say, somewhere in Africa, maybe Ghana, someone realizes their job is at stake, and so they decide to just go around cutting all the cables because they know that if they cut the cable, however clever all your systems are, it's not going to work. Um, what, what would you do to prevent something like this? I think you have to take people with you on the journey, they have to realize there's a burning platform, that we're not just doing this because we think it's, it's interesting to do. You know, we're doing this because we're not going to have a business in the future. And that's the kind of dialogue uh, that we're having. And um, it may be that in order for the penny to drop, you know, certain operations have to uh, get worse before this is embraced. But that's the way we're tackling this. And I must say, uh, you mentioned Ghana. Uh, we've talked to organized labor in Ghana, and I think they're probably further down the maturity curve possibly than other organized labor entities on this journey. And again, the question is, okay, we understand you've got to do it, we understand the mine will die if we don't, but what do we do with the people? So again, it's, it's that kind of conversation. But you're right, you know, there will be elements, of course, you have to manage. That's a risk with this process. Fantastic. Nick, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.